Chapter 4 Link spent the night in the steeple, rather than try to make camp in a place that he could potentially be ambushed by bow goblins. He had climbed down briefly to collect some of the boar meat that the bow goblin had been cooking earlier, though. He wrapped himself in the king's cloak, which proved to be surprisingly warm for something worn by a spirit, and leaned against the cold brick wall, eating a few strips of the meat until he fell into a fitful sleep. He dreamt while he slept, graphic dreams that eventually woke him up feeling anxious and disoriented. What he dreamt, however, was a mystery. The contents of the dream were as floating as his memories, occasionally just at the edge of his mind, but unable to be grasped in any detail. Perhaps they had been memories themselves. He did not know. When he finally did awake for the final time, he saw that the sun was beginning to rise just to the left of the distant dueling peaks, as King Rome had called them. The sky was still dark to the west, but lightened to shades of violet and pink the further east he looked. For a time, he enjoyed simply watching the sunrise, gradually bathing the land in its light. It was peaceful. He kept himself wrapped in the cloak as he watched. The plateau was chilly in the morning. Eventually, the time came for him to rise and began gathering up his equipment. He once again strapped his sword to his back, along with his shield. He shoved the pouch of rupees into the satchel he'd taken from the king's things earlier the day prior. He slipped the gloves onto his hands and wrapped the loop of rope around his right shoulder. Finally, he picked up the paraglider, looking at it dubiously. Stepping forward, he looked down from the steeple to the ground below. The king had said the paraglider would slow his fall. Would it work when jumping off the Temple of Time? He considered the distance between him and the ground. It was high, to be sure, but likely survivable, as long as he landed correctly. If he landed incorrectly, however, he would likely break his legs, if not worse. Well, he said, smiling tightly. That's a pleasant thought. And then he jumped from the steeple before he could second guess his decision, gripping the glider tightly in his gloved hands. For a brief moment, he was falling, and his stomach seemed to end up somewhere in the region of his throat. However, after that heartbeat, he found that his descent had slowed as the glider suddenly filled with air above his head. Amazingly, he slowly floated down to the ground just as the king had said. When he touched down on the ground, he did so gently. No broken legs. Not even as much as a bruised foot. He brought the glider down to eye level so that he could marvel at its construction. How was such a thing even possible? It took Link several seconds of examining the glider to finally determine how to unlock the hinges that would allow it to fold up. Once folded, it became fairly portable. It would not fit in the satchel by any means, but its lightweight made it easy to carry in one hand. He would eventually have to figure out an easier way to travel with so many possessions, however. As it stood now, he did not have any real means of traveling with food or other supplies. He had a few weapons, a satchel containing some rupees, and an old bowstring, rope, and an apparently magical paraglider. He would need more supplies than that if he hoped to travel any significant amount of distance. Sign, Link approached the temple outer wall, where he'd left the unstrung bow to the day before. It was thankfully right where he'd left it, and he picked it up. His next thought was food, and he stepped into the Temple of Time, only to find that the boar carcass, as well as the remaining cooked meat, had gone missing. It had to mean that there were still bow goblins in the area as well. Great, he thought. He would have to keep an eye out for more ambushes. He began walking, 
while he tried to be quiet, it was very obvious to him that if there were any Bokoblins still in the area, they would likely be able to hear him. No attack came, however, as he made his way down the hill. Perhaps the string of bodies that he had left in his wake the day before had scared them off from the area. That would at least be one positive in light of everything Link had done the day before. It did not take Link very long to reach the base of the Sheikah Tower, which still stood where it had been yesterday, blue light emanating from its core and the distant platform overhead. Along the way, Link had managed to gather several apples from a large apple tree, which he had stuffed into his pack after greedily eating three. The apples helped, both hunger and thirst, though he knew he would soon need something more substantial. He still had some meat left over from the boar, but knew it would not last long. It would probably be safe to eat for the rest of the day, at most. He wondered if he ever had hunted in his past. His attempts at stealth thus far had not gone over as well as he'd have hoped, but he seemed to be a decent shot with a bow. He wondered if he could make some kind of trap. After considering this for a moment, he was forced to admit that, regardless of whatever skills he had in the past, he certainly did not know how to make a proper animal trap now. He could probably shoot one with an arrow, but he would likely only have a single shot for most animals. It was something he would have to attempt later. For now, he had some cooked boar meat and apples. It would suffice for a time. As he came down the final hill, before reaching the tower, he noticed something that he hadn't seen before. A small water reservoir with broken stone pillars on either side. It looked out of place, and as Link approached, he thought that he could see why. The pillars upon closer inspection were the remains of ancient stone arches, and beneath the water Link could see the remains of a staircase that led down towards the stone wall that ringed the entire plateau. An ancient guardian also sat half submerged in the water. The king said that the entrance of the plateau had been collapsed and flooded, Link thought as he gazed down at the still pond. It was clear to him that he was looking at what used to be a far easier method of getting off the plateau than what Rome had given him. After some consideration, Link knelt on the ground and scooped his hands in the water. He brought it to his lips, taking a tentative sip. After determining that the water tasted fine and seemed safe, he filled his water skin and took a deep drink of it. He topped it off once more and then stood, looking at the walls surrounding the Great Plateau. A section of it had broken away nearby, and Link decided that would do as well as anywhere else. A few minutes later, he found himself staring out at a beautiful field with rolling hills, large trees, and a surprising number of ruins. Not to mention the very large drop. A sudden gust of wind from behind nearly made Link stumble, and he quickly took a step back, not wanting to accidentally fall off. That drop would certainly be the death of him. He didn't particularly think he was afraid of heights. Not really. But he was fairly certain that anyone faced with the prospect of leaping off a giant cliff with nothing but what appeared to be a sheet stretched out by some pieces of wood would feel apprehensive. Then again, maybe Hylians were all just madmen. He certainly couldn't remember either way. Regardless, Link found himself inspecting the wall for any possible way to climb down. The wall was made of large cut stones, and he thought that he saw several potential ledges that he could rest on. But there weren't nearly enough handholds that he could see. The king was probably right. The paraglider was likely the only way off this plateau. It was decided then. Link stepped closer to the ledge, and did what he could to swallow his fear. Far below him was what looked like the ruins of an old outpost. Several large flagstaffs still rose, lining either side of the road far below, though no trace of the old flags that once may have flown on them remained. It seemed like as good a place as any to start his journey. Holding his paraglider over his head, he took a deep breath and leaped off the edge of the Great Plateau. The glider caught the air immediately, and he felt strangely light in the air. He held on tightly to the twin handholds and was amazed to see the ground far below him lazily passing by. He wasn't just slowly falling off of the plateau. He was gliding far above the world below. 
the outpost ruins began to rush past beneath his feet. He had already glided further north than he had expected. At that moment, he didn't care, however. Instead, he grinned and laughed, overcome by the sudden sense of freedom that he had felt. He glided through the open air without a care, feeling like a child experiencing the joy of a new toy. A gust of wind caught him, causing his hair to flutter around his face, and the glider followed the direction of the wind. He sailed over a small grove of trees and then spotted a ruined building in his path. It would make a good place to set down. As he passed over a broken wall, he carefully adjusted the angle of the paraglider, canceling his forward movement and slowly lowering to the ground until his feet touched solid ground. The old partially collapsed building's roof had long since rotted away, and the crossbeams that had once held it up were in a heap on the floor. Several old beds lined one wall, all in various states of disrepair and disarray. He thought that he must have landed in some kind of military barrack. He took a moment to examine the contents of the room, looking for anything that might be useful to him, before determining that it was a lost cause. Whatever had once been in here had long since been picked clean. He found the open doorway, and stepped out onto a wide stone road that was partially overgrown with grass. Several more buildings, like the one he'd been in, lined the road, all in various states of ruin. Nearby, a fox started and darted into the underbrush besides one such building. A few birds chirped in the nearby trees. Otherwise, there was only silence. The feeling of elation that Link had felt while gliding off the plateau faded, replaced instead with a growing sense of dread. The Temple of Time had been cut off from any possible caretakers for 100 years. He had assumed, hoped, that was the only reason for its state of decay. But here Link found more ruins. The outpost had been destroyed, perhaps during Ganon's attack 100 years ago, and never rebuilt. How bad! Had things been before the princess sealed the beast? He did not linger in the outpost very long, checking a few of the buildings, but only finding scraps of equipment that had long since been exposed to the elements. He did find a few additional broken down guardians, which he tried to ignore. He continued down the road, finding no other signs of life outside of the occasional wildlife, until he came upon an old stone bridge that was thankfully still standing. From this vantage point, he could see some bow goblins gathered around a fire in a nearby field, as well as a much larger creature. This one was easily twice the size as one of the bow goblins, though it had similar features. A long, pig-like snout, a single horn, and the same fashion sense consisting of wearing only a single tattered loincloth. It had long, hulking arms and short legs. The camp was fairly out of the way from the road, but it served as a good reminder that he wasn't any safer now than he was earlier. He tried to keep a low profile while crossing the bridge and continued on his way, once he was certain that none of the creatures had seen him. The dueling peaks were still far away, and Link hoped to reach them quickly. He made camp within a hollowed-out interior of an ancient, fallen tree trunk. It looked as if it had once stood hundreds of feet tall, and easily had the circumference of the size of a house. The trunk had been broken into multiple parts over the years, and the one Link found himself sheltering in was at the bottom of a large hill. The pieces of the tree could be found in several places on the hill, ending with the ancient trunk at the hill's peak. Link wondered at the age of the tree. It had to be hundreds, if not thousands of years old. How long ago had it fallen? Before making camp, Link had climbed to the top of the hill and surveyed the surrounding landscape, looking for any signs of life around him. As far as he could see, he couldn't see any bow cobbling camps or otherwise. Finally, deciding he was probably safe enough, he did what he could to forge some mule supplies. He didn't have any luck with hunting. The only rabbit he saw was scared off when he accidentally stepped on a twig. But he did find some mushrooms that he hoped were safe to eat. He also managed to find an odd trio of apple trees on another hill. Strangely enough, two of the trees only had one apple each, while the third was quite full of apples. Oddness aside, he picked several of the apples and carried his bundle down toward his campsite. After gathering his meal, 
and noting that the sun was beginning to set below the distant western horizon, he made a small campfire. It took some work, but there was no shortage of wood in the immediate vicinity, much of it old and already ready to catch flame. He made his meal of the remaining boar meat, cooked again to hopefully prevent him from getting sick, and baked apples and mushrooms. Bland as the meal may have been, Link found himself quite satisfied, and settled back against the incline of the hill, lying on his cloak. As night fell, various insect noises picked up, and Link noted a large number of fireflies that seemingly come to life around the ancient log. It's beautiful here, he said to no one in particular. He got no response, and that seemed wrong to him somehow. He didn't know what it was, but something was missing. He suddenly felt melancholy and lonely. He looked to the side and saw a bare patch of ground, not far from him, that seemed empty. He had been the princess' chosen knight, right? Did they travel together? He sighed and sat up, looking at his small fire. His eyes fell on the small pile of possessions nearby, and the Sheikah Slate in particular. He abruptly recalled the change that it had undergone on the tower. He hadn't even looked at it since then to try and determine what the different icons meant. Reaching over, he picked it up and inspected the different icons. Six icons spread across his screen, squares with various colored shapes within them. The first square had a blue circle within it. The second had an angled red U-shape in it. The third a yellow padlock. The fourth what appeared to be a white snowflake. The fifth had a simple icon with a dashed line ending in a red X. And the sixth had a strange orange segmented cylinder. Link touched the last one first, and was surprised when suddenly the screen of the Sheikah Slate appeared to become translucent. He could see the fire behind it, as if the Sheikah Slate center was made entirely of glass. His eyes widened as he found himself looking through the screen at its surroundings. After a moment, he touched another icon, a plus symbol, and suddenly the image on the screen magnified. He could make out the fine grain of the tree trunk around him, as if he were standing inches from it and inspecting it from close. Another press of the plus symbol brought the view even closer, though the image had grown blurry and out of focus. He stood and quickly hurried outside. It was dark and therefore difficult to make out the details of his surroundings, but it was clear that the magnification offered by the device would be incredibly useful for scouting. He angled the slate up towards the moon, and found that he was able to make out a great deal more detail on its surface than with his naked eye. Link found that the plus symbol was no longer available to be pressed, but he spotted a minus sign directly under it. Pressing this, the magnification on the slate returned back to normal. He grinned and continued to, well, play with this for a time, enjoying how useful it would likely prove itself to be. Eventually, he pressed a small arrow in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, which made the screen opaque and brought back the colored icons from before. He pressed the next icon from the right, and the screen shifted once again, this time becoming a colorful overhead map. A small icon in its center seemed to indicate Link's own location. It was incredibly detailed, showing various landmarks around him with their titles, including what appeared to be a small pond that he hadn't even seen on his earlier scouting. Experimenting with the various icons on the screen, Link found that he was able to zoom in on various locations, and even place a variety of his own icons and notes on the map. Amazed at the level of detail and utility that this device provided, he continued back to the original screen, inspecting the other icons. The snowflake was his first disappointment. When he pressed this, a small message in red text flashed across the bottom of the screen. Unable to use Cryonis Rune. No body of water detected. Considering this, he determined to try this out on the next body of water that he passed. Instead, he went to the next icon, the yellow lock icon. Pressing this changed the screen on the Sheikah Slate again. It once more became translucent, but now everything seemed to be bathed in a strange yellow light through the screen. A small cross symbol also appeared in its center. As this cross was drawn over various objects, he found they were highlighted with a brighter yellow light. He highlighted a small stick on the ground 
and pressed another lock icon on the bottom right corner of the screen. Suddenly, a beam of yellow light shot out from the Sheikah slate, striking the stick. At once, the stick was bathed in the same yellow light that the screen had shown, the light visible without the Sheikah slate. Eyeing the stick curiously, Link approached it and knelt. The yellow light pulsed faintly, illuminating the grass around it. He hesitantly reached out, touching the stick, and was surprised to find it did not move at all from his touch. He attempted to pick it up, but it wouldn't budge from its spot on the ground. Frowning, he pulled harder, grunting with exertion. He placed the Sheikah slate down and tried to use both hands, though he found it to be difficult to get a good grip on it, as he could not get his fingers under the stick very easily. Finally, he stepped back, amazed at the Sheikah slate's ability to seemingly freeze the stick in place. He noticed that the pulsing light had grown much quicker now. It grew quicker, and quicker, until suddenly the stick flashed with light and went flying far into the air, spinning away into the distance. Of course, this required much further investigation. Sometime later, and only after he had successfully launched several more objects into the night, did he think he had a good handle on how this rune, labeled Stasis, worked. It could freeze objects, halting any and all movement for a short period of time. However, any kinetic action such as pulling or striking the object appeared to be saved and all applied at once when the object was unfrozen. As a result, even multiple small pushes and taps could result in a rather large reaction. It had limits, however. The larger and heavier an object was resulted in a much shorter period of time spent frozen. When he attempted to use the rune on the log he was camping within, the stasis only lasted mere moments. It also appeared to work on living things, as he was able to freeze several of the fireflies that lit up the night around him. The acting of freezing them alone did not seem to cause any harm, though he was careful not to touch any of the frozen insects, lest he accidentally crush them. He could also only freeze one object at a time, and could manually release objects frozen before the timer counted down, by pressing the stasis button again. Excited to see the next icon's functionality, Link then pressed the rune labeled Magnesis. Like the stasis rune before it, it turned the screen translucent again, but this time bathed everything in red. He frowned as he looked around with his screen, as the icon on the bottom right of the screen appeared not to do anything. It wasn't until he found his sword lying by this fire in his screen that the Sheikah Slate screen showed anything different. The sword glowed red in the screen. He pressed the button, and suddenly, the slate in his hand shuddered slightly. Something happened to the sword as well, as it suddenly shook, and when he adjusted his grip on the slate, appeared to follow his movements. Eyes widening, he lifted the slate above his head, and the sword followed, rising into the air, as if lifted by unseen strings. He laughed and practiced moving the sword around in the air, and it followed wherever his screen was pointed at. However, when he attempted to press some of the additional buttons available on the screen, the screen suddenly turned black and the sword fell to the ground, point sinking into the dirt. The screen turned back on a moment later, the text scrolling across the bottom. Error. Magnesis room damaged. Repairs needed to restore full functionality. Somewhat disappointed, he continued to experiment with the rune, swinging the sword around. At one point, he got its point lodged into the old wooden log. That was when he truly understood how powerful a weapon this rune could end up being with practice. Marveling at the slate's functionality, Link pressed the last icon, excited to see what would happen next. To his surprise, the screen did not turn translucent this time. Instead, something flashed on the ground in front of him. He looked down, surprised to see what appeared to be a simple blue glowing ball sitting on the ground a few feet in front of him. He pressed the blue button again. This was a mistake. There was a brilliant flash of brilliant white light, and he was hit with a concussive blast that sent him flying backwards. He hit the ground some five to ten feet away, ears ringing, and feeling like he'd just been hit full in the chest by a charging bull. For a moment, he couldn't see or hear anything, the bright flash having blinded and deafened him. His chest hurt quite a bit, in fact, now that he thought about it, his entire body hurt. 
His vision slowly returned, but it was blurry. Slowly, with a pained groan, he rolled onto his stomach and coughed violently, trying to fight down a sudden wave of nausea. Once his coughing fit subsided and his vision cleared, he slowly rose to his knees. Noticing that he no longer had the Sheikah slate in his hands, he looked around and found it sitting a few feet away from him. He tried to stand, but a sudden wave of dizziness informed him that that was a bad idea. Instead, he crawled over to the slate and turned it over so the screen was facing him. Written across its bottom, in red letters, was a simple message. Warning. Standing too close to the remote bomb rune explosion can result in bodily harm or death. Please be sure to stand a safe distance back and ensure no one is in danger of being injured or flying shrapnel. Well, Link said with another cough, maybe I should read the warning next time. He rolled back onto his back and closed his eyes, groaning. The next day, Link still felt quite sore, but had thankfully escaped with only scrapes and bruises following his experimentation with the remote bomb rune. He had decided against doing any more testing that night, however, not wanting to attract any undue attention to his location with explosions. When he finally awoke, the sun was well into the sky, and the air within the tree trunk was pleasantly warm. He ate a hastily put together breakfast, and gathered up his supplies before getting on the road again. As he walked down the hill, he was surprised to see a large black circle of burnt grass and dirt on the ground where the bomb had exploded the night before. Dangerous indeed, but possibly a useful weapon. All in all, he was very satisfied by the utility offered by the Sheikah Slate, and hoped to experiment with it further later on, after his bruised ribs healed. He grew irritated as clouds soon covered the sun, and a light, cold rain began to fall. The cloak helped for a little while, but it quickly became soaked through as well. He hoped the rain would cease quickly, but quite unfortunately, it continued for several more hours, finally abating late in the afternoon. The road Link traveled on was a muddy mess, and his soaked cloak was cold and heavy. He finally removed it after the rain stopped, though that did little to warm him. The day was cooler today than the day before, though having the sun on his back helped somewhat. He hadn't traveled nearly as far this day as he had the day prior, his progress slowed by the rain and mud, and still he saw no other travelers on the road. He did finally find himself approaching the dueling peaks, however. As he approached the large split mountain, though, he found himself drawing alongside another Sheikah Tower, this one shining orange. It was in the center of a river that flowed around the center of the dueling peaks, and impossible to reach without going for a swim which he didn't find particularly palatable after the long walk in the rain. Still, though, the tower bothered him. The last time he'd activated one of the towers, it had restored additional functionality to his Sheikah Slate. He wondered if this tower would do the same. It was in considering this that he recalled that there was one additional rune that he had not yet been able to test or determine its functionality. It had required being near a body of water. Deciding that there was no time like the present, he pulled the Sheikah Slate off his belt and held it up, facing the water. He hit the snowflake button again, and this time the screen turned translucent, highlighting the water of the Falloon River with blue light. Curious, he pressed the button at the bottom right of the screen, the same snowflake-shaped icon as before. A sharp crack noise rang out through the air. Link jumped in surprise and watched with awe as the water at the spot where he'd been pointing the Sheikah Slate at swirled around, rising up and solidifying into a cube-shaped block of ice. Ice crystals like snow appeared in the air around the cube of ice, slowly drifting down to rejoin the water still flowing around it. Strange Sheikah runes glowed on its side. Surprisingly, the pillar appeared unaffected by the flow of the river, remaining perfectly still in its flow. Link released the breath he hadn't even realized he'd been holding. It was incredible. Where before, there had just been rushing water, now there stood a solid block of ice. How is this even possible? He glanced down at the Sheikah Slate, and, after a moment, pressed the Cryonis rune again. The slate was still pointed at the existing block of ice, and when he pressed it, the block suddenly cracked down the middle. It cracked again, and then broke into several large chunks of ice that were immediately carried away by the river. Grinning, 
he began to experiment with this new rune. He quickly discovered that there were more options than just a single block of ice. He could create blocks of ice of varying heights and widths, indeed creating a shallow set of stairs. There were limitations. He could only have a few blocks in existence before the earlier ones started to crack and fail. And there was a sort of time limit to the ice blocks as well. They would eventually fail on their own after several minutes. Still though, this was going to prove incredibly useful for crossing bodies of water. Starting, he decided, right now. He began to create a series of small stepping stones made of ice on the river. Once he had three in place, all within easy stepping distance, he hesitantly placed a foot on the first. It didn't bob under his weight at all, remaining solidly in place. It was slippery, however, though the surface wasn't perfectly smooth. It felt almost as though the ice had a thin layer of snow atop it, which helped with traction to a small degree. Still, it would not be good to take this too quickly. He cautiously moved forward, and as he created the next couple of platforms, he heard the ice blocks behind him crack and fail. It was an intimidating sound, and he felt his palms begin to sweat. He was beginning to hope this wasn't a mistake. Still, though, he made his way across the river. He almost fell in once as he approached a spot of choppier flow. The additional chop caused water to splash up onto the surface of the block of ice, and he momentarily slipped, windmilling his arms to keep himself from tumbling over into the river's depths. After that, he began to make the ice blocks a little taller to prevent waves from splashing over top them. Finally, Link reached a series of large rocks at the foot of the tower. It looked as though this tower, like the one on the Great Plateau, had also burst up from the ground, displacing these stones in the process. He was very grateful to have rock underfoot again, rather than ice, but still couldn't help but to look back at the distance he had crossed. What else could this piece of equipment accomplish? The climb up the tower was not an easy climb, as the tower was rather tall. However, like the previous one, it had several platforms forming a spiral around its length, which served as convenient platforms upon which to rest. He reached the top and stood up, looking out the land around him. The Great Plateau was surprisingly far away. He could just barely make out its walls over the distant horizon, hazy with the distant and approaching darkness. He had progressed further than he truly realized. From this vantage point, he was able to see far and wide around him, he could see several pinpricks of light that signified campfires, which he quickly investigated with the Sheikah Slate. He only felt disappointment, however, when he found the nearest campfires to belong to Bokoblins and those larger creatures. They seemed to be numerous in this region. Were they simply not at all as dangerous as the ones on the plateau? Or did the Hylians that remained after the Calamity just not have the means to drive them away? That thought concerned him. He had yet, after two days of travel, to pass a single other soul on the road. Thus far, he had avoided confrontation with the Bokoblins as well. The roads didn't seem that dangerous. So where was everyone? Had Ganon's destruction been that bad? If so, how was he supposed to make any difference? He slowly walked around the edge of the tower until he was facing towards the distant Hyrule Castle. He swallowed and cleared his throat. Princess? He said hesitantly. Princess, can you hear me? He received no answer, and exhaled slowly. How am I supposed to do this? How was I ever expected to do this? I can't even remember who I am, who I was. Again, he only received silence as a reply. He wanted to say more. He felt he should say more. But what could he say? He remained silent for a long time after, before finally speaking again, his voice soft. The king said I was your chosen knight. He said that you saved me in the end. I... Thank you. I wish I could remember. He fell silent after this, and finally turned back to the small pedestal at the center of the tower. Like the one before, it had a stalactite-like structure of black rock over the pedestal. Link placed his Sheikah Slate down upon the indentation in its center, and watched 
as the blue runic characters appeared on the rock above it. They gathered near its point, and then the drop of blue liquid fell onto the Sheikah Slate's surface. As this happened, the light of the tower turned blue, just like the previous tower. Link gathered up the Sheikah Slate, but did not find any additional runes on its menu. Instead, he found a simple text that read, Sheikah Tower Activated. Teleportation Point Activated. Error. Teleportation Rune Non-Functional. Detecting Nearby Guardians. Error. No Nearby Guardians Detected. Scowling, Link pressed his finger to the screen, which cleared away the text, revealing the same runes that had been there before. Feeling somewhat disappointed, Link hooked the Sheikah Slate to his belt and approached the edge, facing the distant river shore. After considering the distance that the wind was blowing, he pulled his paraglider from the makeshift carrier that he'd made with the rope given to him by the king, and unfolded it. He checked the wind direction once more, and then leaped off the tower, floating above the river. Once he'd touched down on the ground, he set out to make camp. Evening was beginning to fall, and he was confident from his scouting atop the tower that he was alone in this patch of land. His flood supplies were beginning to dwindle, however, and he knew that he would need more food in the morning. At least he was next to a source of fresh water, however. Finding a decent tree with which to shelter under, he set about making himself another small fire. It would be good to at least be able to properly dry his clothes as well, as they had never fully dried after the rain from earlier in the day. It wasn't long after he had eaten another meal of baked apples and mushrooms that he settled down to sleep through the night. That night, under the tree by the river. He dreamt of a beautiful woman with shining blonde hair gazing at him from across a great distance. Her hair was pulled back away from her face and tucked behind two pointed ears. She wore a flowing white dress that reached all the way down to her ankles, or she wore simple brown leather sandals. She seemed to be trying to tell him something. He could see her lips moving, but he was unable to hear anything. He took a step towards her, and then another, but she did not seem to get any closer. He took several more steps, and abruptly broke into a run. In that moment, he knew he had to reach her. He had to see her, to hear her, to protect her. Darkness fell between them, causing Link to stop abruptly. The woman was hidden from his view, but he thought he heard the faintest voice upon the wind. Link, it said. Gritting his teeth, he tried to press forward into the darkness, searching out the woman. If he could just see her again. He awoke with a start. Like water cupped in his hand, the dream quickly drained away from his memory, soon only leaving a strange sense of desperation, and that single word whispered upon the wind. <laughs>